Happy Monday. How's it going? It's going well. How are you doing, Joe? Doing good. How was your weekend? It was uh, it was good. <laughs> it was a lot of uh, writing and editing, basically. But you know, final stretch here. That's how it goes. So. Yeah, that's how it goes. It's uh, <laughs> why we get paid the big bucks. Um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, or something like that. Yep. Um, well, awesome. So yeah, today we wanted to um, uh, talk about um, what's next after the modern data stack. So uh, this is something that I think we've been kind of, uh, you know, going around the edges on a bit, talking about this mm -hmm. topic, um, you know, figured that um, it deserves a, you know, a, a, I think a wider discussion. So let's get into it. For, for people who don't know, I, I suppose, what is the modern data stack? That is a very good question. So the, here's how I'd define it roughly. It, it's that you take things like Informatica, so a very traditional data tool that takes care of a lot of the stuff that your database actually doesn't directly do. So in other words, ETL, that happens in Informatica, transformation, a lot of data management tasks, um, data quality, to some extent, data monitoring. And so in the modern data stack, what we're essentially doing is unbundling those into separate components, typically. And a lot of those components can be open source as well. How would you define it? I don't know. What, I'm probably missing some things here. What's your definition, Joe? I mean, I think the you know the the, the original definition focused on the adoption of of cloud uh, and, and managed mm -hmm. and SaaS services, right? So, in terms of the workflows, I don't necessarily see much that has changed, and we'll get into this in a bit, I, with the exception of maybe adopting software engineering principles. But what's really um, I, I think distinguishes the quote modern data stack from you know prior data stacks is just um you know uh, modularity composability yeah. um you know every, as you point out everything's sort of um unbundled not to beat to death a term that has <laughs> been in the zeitgeist lately but um definitely a cloud-based unbundling um which I, I think makes it a lot easier to um you know use uh, certain services that were before as you point out very monolithic so yeah exactly and so that on the one hand, that gives you a lot more flexibility for the services you compose together, right? And it means things like, okay, my data quality, data observability can improve separately from my ETL tool. That's one of the core ideas. On the other hand, it does create a good degree of complexity to manage. And typically when we talk about the modern data stack, it's still batch oriented. So it's still oriented towards processing chunks of data, whether we're talking about once a day or once an hour versus a continuously streaming approach. Sorry, my dog's going crazy right now. We're um, going to interview her today. We don't have a guest. She, she's she's the guest this yeah. time. So. Um, yeah, and I think that, that that's, a, that's a good point too. Um, and so you'll typically see the modern data stack described as, um, you know, data pipelines, cloud-based data pipelines. This might be like a five tran, for example, or Matillion or something like that. These are vendors that are commonly associated with, um, you know, the pipeline part of the d data stack. And then you have... Um, you know, a cloud-based data warehouse, uh, like, you know, BigQuery, Snowflake, uh, Redshift, and we'll talk about that in a second, because I think, you know, when you look at the origins of the modern data stack, it's actually 10 years old, um, according to at least, I think, many of the original definitions where you're talking cloud-based data warehouses. Um, I think Redshift was, you know, by popularity, the, the um, you know, the one that kicked it off. I'm sure we can make some arguments that there might have been some predecessors to that, but... Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think it's. I think it kicked off with Redshift in 2012. Oh, it really did. That's ten years yeah. ago. That's it's, ten years ago. And it's Postgres, right? <laughs> Behind the scenes, it's not. Yeah. It's not even brand new technology, right? It's Columnar, yeah. which is not typical Postgres configuration, but it's still Postgres. Behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you kind of had that evolution. You know, I I, I remember when um, I saw the announcement for Redshift actually uh, ten years ago, and I was like, this seems like a pretty cool idea. So, you know, let's. Um, you know, I, I, it'll be interesting to see what happens with it. And, I, and apparently a lot happened with it. So, uh, you know, and I think the, the benefits of the modern data stack is definitely that it's, uh, you know, I, I would say up until that point data, well, there's kind of two threads to this. So one data science was, um, you know, starting to bubble up as an area of interest to a lot of people. And I think starting to grow in popularity in the early 2010s, um, kind of analogous to this or kind of a parallel path was um, the rise of these cloud data warehouses and, and data lakes as well. What this did is it kind of, I think, took whatever the big data era was of the um, kind of the late 2000s yeah. and, and brought these techniques. And, it, and I would say more importantly, that this um, scalable technology, this distributed technology to the masses 
And I think that's yes. the really big, um, you know, success of the modern data stack. It's not so much that uh, there were, I would say, new novel ways of doing stuff as much as it, it I think it made all this, uh, all these practices and technologies very accessible to people, which spawned a, a giant um, resurgence in data. But what, what I, what I want to get to with data science and analytics, what I found interesting is at the same time, in the, especially in the early 2010s, analytics had been written off for debt actually by a lot of data scientists. Yeah. And, uh, like you would say, a lot of this was just cargo culting, right? I mean, the reality is that Hadoop was was a great stack for what it did, but a lot of the stuff people were doing with Hadoop was just analytics, except that people would call it big data because it was cool and new. It's not analytics or BI anymore, even though it actually was. This is like big data and we're getting brand new insights because now we can process 100 terabytes, never mind that I only have a few gigabytes of data that I'm right. processing <laughs> Sure, but yeah. yeah, but I mean, what you know, the the cool thing is uh, tools like BigQuery, for example, like we use this uh, in our yeah. advanced SQL class. I mean, that that's perfectly capable of uh, querying anything from you know data sets of in the bytes all the way to data site uh, data sizes in the petabytes or or probably more. But um, you know, kind of everything in between. But the the cool thing with something like a BigQuery is you just give it data and start querying it. There's not much to it. So. Well, the thing, funny thing about BigQuery as well is that most people don't realize it came out about the re same time as Redshift, but Redshift was way, way more popular. And now it's kind of more on parity in terms of a little more on parity. Yeah, but I mean, it, a lot of that I think is Google Cloud too. Totally Google Cloud, is, yeah. Yeah, until I would say the last several years, they, they just weren't, I think they had some of the best technology, but for whatever reason, I, I think they're just very poor at marketing the they products totally to people. Yeah, because yeah, because I remember seeing BigQuery too. I was like, I don't yeah. even. I, it seems cool, but I'm not sure what this is. Right, right, exactly. I remember seeing like I clicked a link for it. But this was back in 2015, and I'm like, okay, like I know what Teradata is because that's what in Hadoop I was using those tools at the time. I couldn't figure out what BigQuery was. I knew it ran on SQL, but I'm like, what is the point of this tool? I I don't get it at all. Whereas Redshift, it was immediately obvious this is a Teradata competitor, but it runs in yeah, the cloud. Yeah, it's, it's, it says data warehouse <laughs> in it, right? So you know, and so. It, you know, and, and along the way, you know, um, I think the other interesting evolutions of the modern data stack were uh, data integrations became very easy before you you would have to either write these yourselves or come up with complex workflows, maybe SSIS, Informatica Talent or something like that. And certainly those are, you know, great options uh, for the time. But then you started seeing the rise of, um, you know, uh, just basically point and click connectors, Fivetran, I think, being the you know, the, the biggest one um, or the most predominant one that came out and for full disclosure, we're partners with Google Cloud, Fivetran, Snowflake, Quintillion, all these companies we mentioned. Um, but that said, we also take, a, I think, a fairly objective stance on, you know, the, the history and, and where these products stand in the, in the universe. And so but back to the pipelines, that, that was yeah. also a big revolution. Um, I remember getting a, an email from, you know, uh, one of the founders of Fivetran back in I think it was 2016. And he's like, do you want to try out this new product called Fivetran? And it's like, maybe it seems interesting but it's like yeah it seems probably not like a good fit so you know we used advertising as advertising as a way to move data from like postgres to redshift and so forth and i thought that was pretty interesting um you know but then I, along the way you know five time was also promoting this um idea of elt uh because before it was um etl extract transform load which was the paradigm that anybody in data warehousing would be using and i think it's still popular, but the notion with ELT is, well, if you have all this massive computation in your data warehouse, why not use that to crunch your data instead of having it all, in the, you know, in the old old days, you'd be doing ETL and like very, um, uh, I would say there'd be a lot of resource contention perhaps, right? Where you're running your, your ETL and maybe the same server that your database runs on or, um, you know, or other monolithic um, you know, data, um, pipelines and so forth. So by separating it out and then running all the computation and transformations in your data warehouse, I think that fundamentally changed the thinking of a lot of people and then spawned, you know, I would say new uh, companies and new projects like DBT, for example, which now has got the lion's share, I would say, in the modern data stack for transformation. So yeah, I, I should point out that there's some confusion we hear frequently around um, ELT because they're kind of two different mm, notions. Yeah. So one notion of ELT is sort of this data lake idea that I don't think is so pervasive anymore, but 
back in like 2016, maybe this was kind of the idea that you just dump everything into your data lake and you actually don't model it, you don't transform it. You ELT was something that would happen on read. So the assumption was that you kind of model it when you were actually querying it. And the other notion of ELT is that it's it's still done in advance. You still model the data, you still pre-process it, you prepare it, but it happens inside the data warehouse rather than in a separate system like Informatica. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And so for the longest time, you know, what we noticed is I would say from maybe 2016, 2017 to now, ELT is the predominant way of, um, at least in, in, you know, our echo chamber of transforming yeah, data, right? Fair. Yeah, to be <laughs> fair. Um, but, you know, I, I would say that's definitely the case with the uh, modern data stack echo chamber and and the, in the rise of analytics engineers as well, which we can talk about for a bit. What, what is an analytics engineer? Um, I mean, I think the idea of analytics engineering is to acknowledge that business intelligence, data modeling, ELT, ETL, whichever paradigm you're using, data pipelines actually require engineering acumen. And the attitude in the past was that this was more of a business function, maybe not an IT function. And so I think the name acknowledges that this is more, it is sophisticated and you need to use a whole constellation of tools. And the idea is that it kind of sits adjacent to data engineering. So maybe you're not quite as concerned about things like data science, but you're doing a lot of the same type of work to feed the business, feed business intelligence and reporting and such. Yeah. And it's also, you know, the notion that um, I, I think, so I would say if the, if one, if the modern data sector, one thing, it democratized a lot of practices yep. to analysts, whereas before you would have to have, you know, a data team or data engineers to help you with um, setting up pipelines, transforming data and so forth. Um, analytics engineering really brought a lot of those um uh, that capability to the analysts themselves that you just write SQL, do the transformations themselves and, and really just, uh, um, you know, I, I think have a lot more control over the workflow. So, yeah. And, and to me, it, it actually sits very, very adjacent to data science as well. And this is what I mean by that. Um, early 2010s, data scientists were doing a lot of stuff on their laptops. And so finally, like mid 2010s, there was this acknowledgement that, data scientists were doing really a lot of data engineering and this new tool set of the modern data stack would help both data scientists and analysts to do a lot more effective engineering basically by having these common components that you could use and recycle and allow actual proper cloud deployments as opposed to just trying to process data on my laptop and no one else has the code and they don't know what's going on with it and it's not scalable or production ready. Wait, so you're saying that it's an anti-pattern to uh, <laughs> uh, use your notebooks for everything? Uh, especially, especially if they're not in a distributed environment, or at least in a, in an environment where people can see them where and collaborate. Can, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you leave I, your, you know, you leave your uh, laptop on the subway and like six months of work are gone. Like that, that's not good. Mm -mm. Don't do that. No, but what was also cool is we, you know, things like Git, you know, software yeah. engineering practices yeah. starting, be, started becoming more commonplace in analytical and data science workflows. I think that was cool because, you know, fast forward or kind of rewind actually to, you know, again, the early 2010s, data science was very much, um, you know, a local machine problem. Yes. For, for most people, I, obviously, if you're working at a, a big tech company, uh, maybe you were doing something a bit, um, you know, more sophisticated. But even at, at these big tech companies, I mean, you know, now, like your Ubers and your Airbnbs, like I've, I've talked to, you know, the, the some of the original data science and data teams there, and it was every company starts from somewhere. And all the successes that you read about now are, are not what they used to have, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Chase Sharma, who was, um, you know, he, he's uh, from EPO. He was Airbnb's fourth data scientist. And he spoke at our um, Utah data engineering meetup, uh, I think it was last month and gave an excellent talk. But he said, yeah, back in the day, it was <laughs> that we didn't have the infrastructure that we have now. Airbnb is highly regarded as a, a data centric organization, but it, that was not always the case. Like everybody starts from somewhere. And so maybe, and, and the common thing back then was definitely, you know, developing on notebooks on your laptop and, and so forth. But then, you know, as you find value from data, your practices become more sophisticated. And, and along the way, again, the, the introduction of software engineering practices into data, you know, whether you call it data ops or data observability and so forth, like this, I think was another game changer. We started seeing this sort of towards the tail end of the 2010s, early 2020s. And now, it, you know, there's, you know, the, the hot stuff is all the observability startups, for example, um, you know, quality, all these things which were widely ignored because you're basically developing locally is, is now front and center because it doesn't, 
uh, well, the world's just a different place. <laughs> so yeah, the other big shift is that these applications like Airbnb and Uber and even Google are data applications, and they are much more quote unquote live than data applications of yesteryear, which means yep. that Airbnb can dynamically respond to things that are going on and present new analytics to the user to say, hey, this is what prices are like right now. These are places where you should be looking for a place to stay. Or, hey, Uber is very busy right now. You may wanna, might want to wait a few minutes because your pricing is going to be higher than it was in the past. And that can't work if it's on someone's laptop running batch like once a week, right? It does not work at all. So mm -hmm. you've got to get those processes deployed into production. And that's where we have become much more operationalized on the data science side because people had to do that in order to compete. Right. Well, you mentioned the word live too, and I think mm -hmm. this is this is a big game changer we're going to jump into because, you know, so I think we described that you know um, in our own you know way the the evolution and the history of the modern data stack. But I think as you and I sit here, you know, um, having you know spent the, the the last year writing about uh, the field of data engineering, um, I would say being very embedded in you know both the past, the present, and the future of. Data, many types of data stacks, not just the modern data stack. I think, you know, you and I would agree, it's hard to sit here and say, okay, so whatever we call the modern data stack, cloud data warehouse, cloud lake house, whatever, batch oriented, um, like this is, this is where it all, you know, continues for the next 20 years. Like, I, I don't think that this is, I don't think you and I would say that this is like the final stop for the evolution of, of data and data practices and technology. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, here, here's the thing I'll say, like batch is not going away. In other words, we're still going to be processing reporting. We're still going to be probably doing data modeling behind the scenes, you know, once a day data processing. But the more live aspects are going to become much, much more democratized. And so it's going to be much more common to see companies have some kind of real-time data pipeline that informs customer decisions, that informs pricing in near real time. Um, I think in the future, even even small companies are going to be able to have this. And that's what happened with data warehousing over the last 10 years is yep. that a company, a team with like 10 people can now have a data warehouse, like a very small data team. Whereas, you know, in the 90s, this was a huge purchase to purchase an on-prem data warehouse. Oh, geez. Yeah. yeah it's crazy. Well, in like, the 2000s, yeah. yeah. Well, even now, if you wanted to purchase an on-prem, I mean, you, you know, you're dealing with, you're dealing with a contract. Yeah. And it's a, you know, some, you know, a year at least commitment, probably more. I mean, we, we still have discussions with... Um, you know, companies where they ask us what's what's the best approach to yeah. um, you know either I guess shorten the the life of the contract we're on with, with certain vendors, or how do we migrate to the cloud and just get off this thing because it's costing us a lot of money. Um, you know, so that was definitely I think that you know the the big um, if I were to, if I were to say you know one of the bigger contributions of the modern data stack it was just that where you brought again this um, cost prohibitive um, you know high friction. Uh, technology to the masses and again that started with redshift in my opinion and but now what i think you're going to be seeing is you know you mentioned these data apps uh yeah. like like airbnb you know uber yelp uh google i could say is a, you know tiktok is a data app i mean linkedin I mean, LinkedIn, linkedin is a data app for sure your, Jeez. Kafka, right? yeah. yeah amongst a lot yeah a bunch <laughs> of stuff i mean i would say yeah. they're you know among the greatest contributors to the you yeah. know to the world of technology is uh you know linkedin and but you know what I think the next phase of this is the democratization of these types of technologies to the masses too. Right now, it's um, the notion of a data app is talked about, and yeah. I think there's, there's some early um, some early efforts to uh, become, I guess, more integrated with data across your business and what you do. But this doesn't this isn't this doesn't imply that we're talking about the same stuff that the modern data stack accomplished. I think the modern data stack was very much towards um, analytics and data science done by people. Yep. The live data stack, uh, what we call is, is maybe the next evolution of this, but it, what it really means is um, moving the data stack away from the data warehouse and more towards the application itself and having a feedback loop from the time the data is generated all the way through the data life cycle um, whether that's automations um, done by heuristics or machine learning, AI, whatever, and then back to the application and so forth. Um, what this means is reports get automated. Uh, the re the actions you would take from reports get automated. Exactly. Um, yeah. You know, and 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 I was thinking about this over the weekend, and it's this sort of a conversation that um, kind of spawns off of a chat I had last week with somebody. But it was when you think about the nature of analytics, like not a lot. 
the success rate of analytics, I, I'm questioning. I, I haven't seen it actually go up as much as I, I think I would have liked. And what I mean by this is if I look back on the, you know, the, the, the couple decades I've been in data right now, a lot of companies are asking the same types of questions. They are expecting the same kind of results. I would say, depending on how you use analytics, I think it might be used the wrong way in a lot of cases where reports should be used to take actions. But the but typically the actions that you have in a dashboard are not really related to why, they're related to what and when. And so what and when actions, I think, should be automated um, as quickly as possible. Um, and then this allows analysts to focus on the deeper questions of why something happens, which becomes more of decision science at this point, right? And so I think the, the, the evolution of, you know, or, or I guess the consequence of having data move a lot more quickly, you know, with streaming, um, you know, more low latency databases coupled with automated actions um, means that all those dashboards that you used to have, you really don't need them per se. You might need them for historical context, but that's more describing what happened. Companies, I think, are going to, you know, automate the actions you would have taken on the what happened questions or the when did it happen questions, and then have the time to focus on the why, which to me is a much more, it's a much more deeper and value add type of analysis. So I don't know what your thoughts are, but probably highly yeah. controversial and, you know, the peanut gallery is about to come after us on this, but. No, no, no. Let, let's take a concrete example. Okay. So at Uber, do you think someone is like viewing the live dashboard and saying, all right, let's increase prices? Like, no, they're, they, they search yeah. pricing. I mean, I, I know they've changed up the way to do search pricing and things, but the pricing is more or less completely automated and dynamic, right? Behind the scenes, you've got, you've got monitoring, you've got stream monitoring that says, yep. hey, there's a lot of traffic in Manhattan right now. We've got to increase prices to balance out demand. It just happens. Now, that doesn't mean that someone isn't watching the dashboards and saying, hey, there's a huge spike going on. Do we need to manually tune some parameters? But like for the most part, it's an automated system that will just run without human intervention. And the thing is, if you if you think about places where this could apply, let's think about retail pricing. Yes, Amazon does dynamic retail pricing probably with humans mostly out of the loop is my guess. Um, it turns out a lot of online retailers do not have that capability. So if you bring in that capability, what does that do to your business? It actually becomes pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, what about things like dynamic recommenders where if you see a lot of interest in a particular product at a particular time, it can affect your recommender in near real time. That means that your recommender can respond to events in the news because the events in the news affect user traffic, they affect user searches. And then you can say, oh, this particular album suddenly got a lot of likes on Twitter or, or whatever. It's become very popular. And so you can start recommending that a bit more. And it can happen within you know minutes versus waiting for a human to read a report and say, hey, this is really popular. Why don't we start recommending? Well, OK, I'll give you an example of this. I think a very concrete example. So I, I feel like the modern data stack right now is sort of the equivalent of the, the record shop. If people remember what those are back in the, you know, um, just back in the day before people started streaming music or downloading it. But they're, they're back in back in the old days, you used to have to go to, to stores and buy records um, or rent movies. And so what you would have is, you know, um, you know, people who worked at these jobs would would uh, be expert at curating. Uh, you know, they'd recommend movies to you, uh, maybe the cool new album you'd never heard of. Um, I, I, this probably this happens probably within certain types of I would say niche businesses. It didn't used to be niche. This used to be mainstream. This used to be kind of how it was. I remember what Musicland and Blockbuster were, you know, some of the places you would go to either get music or movies, respectively. Well, what about um, back in the eighties before the chains? Even you know, there's just like some yeah. local corner video store you would go to next to your grocery store, get groceries, buy some frozen pizza or something, go to the Go to the VHS shop and grab a movie. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, I used to, I used to, you know, have friends like that that worked at record stores, and yep. I thought that they were the cool, you know, people to, you know, um, to get, you know, music, uh, you know, tips on new music from and stuff. But, you know, and I, and then, you know, I mean, I used to, uh, you know, work as a DJ um, back in the day, so I, I could ask questions about what were the cool new songs to check out. But I mean, a lot of that's automated now. Like, I, I think you know, if you if you listen to Spotify uh, um, radio, for example. I, I do this often. I'm, I'm just very curious what Spotify's algorithm is going to recommend to me. And it's usually fantastic, actually. Um, you know, I, so anymore, I'm, I'm more intrigued by just, uh, you know, the, the automation of suggestions. I think they're, they're, it's pretty fascinating. Um, 
you know, Netflix, I would say to, I don't think they have the volume that like Spotify does in terms of um, songs and stuff. So movies is a bit more interesting because it's like, do I want to, a song's pretty easy, right? Because it's like three minutes or something or five, but like a movie's, you know, maybe two hours of your life. And so that's a bit more of a higher commitment thing. So I'm, you know, less prone to listen to the recommendations of a movie recommender for that reason because i don't really have two hours to waste so well but think about this um it, it's been in the news a lot lately because of course the oscars happened last night and among other things that didn't happened, hear about that at all didn't hear about that at all <laughs> but, but oscar viewership has been dropping for years like a rock mm -hmm. I mean, oscar viewership is just a fraction it was what it was in the 90s well why is that well, well one of my guesses is that we don't have movie monoculture anymore so in other words right. back in the 80s and 90s people for the most part were watching the same movies and now you can watch anything on Hulu or Netflix. So it's like, yeah, okay, the Oscars are cool, but I may or may not care. Like, it's we're not all watching the same stuff. You have your own taste that you develop. With, the, I think it's kind of the conjunction of recommenders plus your friend group. That's kind of how it goes now. Yeah, we all have our bubbles. You know, yeah. I think Chris yeah. Anderson from Wired called this out. Um, you know, well over a decade ago, uh, yeah. two decades ago, almost. You know, when he when he mentioned when he wrote this book called The Long Tail, when we talked mm -hmm. about. You know, so everything basically in the world exists on a power law. So, you know, you have a few top hits and then the uh, long tail of of um, others, right? But what, you know, curation and automated curation and recommendation does is it flips the funnel where now you have access to all that long tail. Like I have no interest in Taylor Swift, for example, zero. I don't care. Um, but I do like all the obscure hipster stuff that I listen to or um whatever so but but the point is this discovery you know these automated systems is just much simpler now um, i i don't even think you know the the my cool friends who worked at record stores would be able to come up with as good of suggestions as spotify does i'm just saying no offense well, to my friends but it's true well you can also combine their suggestions right like yep. they may, once in a while yep. you turned on you onto something but they may have discovered that using an automated suggestion based on their listening history and then they like put it on their blog post yep. know, blog and say hey this is a really cool thing i ran into here's my list of these top 10 you know new music coming out or something right and the other point is that it's more dynamic right so recommenders now instead of being retrained once a week once a month can actually respond to things that are happening in real time to world events to dynamic changes in taste to things that are happening on twitter just because all of that kind of flows in to websites in other words if a, a song gets a lot of likes on twitter for some reason people start listening to it on spotify spotify can dynamically recommend it to more people and so on but could you do that in the modern data stack as it, as See, it is today yeah, and just by itself, you you really can't, right? It's a batch data stack. You need yep. to combine it with more liveness in order to make that work. Right, and so my whole, like, I guess our whole point is, if you have an application that generates data, what's like, what's the point of sending that into um, you know a group of data scientists or analysts? I'm, I know there's use cases for sure, but really, at the end of the day, you're, you're trying to drive. Um, you know, value for your users, for example, right? And, and if you can shorten the feedback loop and the time to value for your users, and to me, that's 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 a very compelling win. It's just coupled with an argument that we hear quite often. You know, it, it sometimes we we hear questions about the value that data teams bring. Um, I would say by focusing more on automation, um, you know, making things live, uh, value becomes very apparent. And so, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think this is what I would say. Um, not not all types of recommenders can be trained in real time, right? In fact, quite a few, at least right now, that's still a challenging problem. But in general, they can be enhanced with real time. So I think what we'll see in most organizations is they're going to continue using the, the modern data stack. They'll continue batch training of recommenders, but they'll also have live components of recommenders that feed yep. in recommendations on top of that. They can respond much, much more quickly. Actually, Igor's got a good comment here. What's up, Igor? Uh, big guy, uh, early OG at Uber as well. Uh, so, you know, he says discovery with AI is great, but it leads to a self-fulfilling prophecy because I listen to a particular um, artist genre. I keep um, getting pushed that artist, uh, which makes you listen to more, which and I said, yeah, I mean, that's why I keep always listening to Nickelback these days. So, um, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and it's, no, I mean, there, there is something for that for sure. Yeah. Um, I, you know, and that's, um, you know, we, we, we could probably continue the discussion focusing on, uh, you know, filter bubbles and news and everything else. And why, you know, I, it's interesting, Max, you say you, you use the word monoculture. And then um, I, I think we've almost replaced one monoculture with another in some ways. 
or instead of you know the the big three news news uh, networks. And I know we're getting a bit off topic here, but hey, it's no, Monday, no, no, this, this is, is what we do topic. best. I mean, yeah. So you know, but. <laughs> You know, the, you said the big three uh, news stations back in the day. Um, mm -hmm. I, in my opinion, they're highly irrelevant right now. They don't really yeah. matter because uh, yeah. I have my own filter bubble. I, I listen to Nickelback and I, I have my, uh, you know, news outlets that I consume and that's that. So, yeah, I, I mean, you talked about reading um, the cyberpunk novels back in the day, right? About this notion of cyberspace before it was really a thing for the general public and reading about how in the future, you know, we'd be immersed in virtual reality. But the thing is, those early ideas were very dystopian. And, and I think to some extent, there was probably a notion of personalization where you would have like almost a privately created slice of reality that would cater to your needs. Is that accurate or not? I, I haven't read as much sci-fi as you. Um, I think that's fair. Yeah. So... Yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, you know, but the, the cyberpunk back in the day talked a lot about, you know, the, um, you know, control of these mega corporations mm -hmm. um, over every aspect of your life. And yeah, I think that's actually pretty accurate. You know, they, they obviously, you know, they, they take it in a bit of a different approach where, you know, governments have collapsed and, you know, people, uh, you know, every, the world's kind of like a combination of Blade Runner and Snow Crash and everything. But I, you know, I can't say that that's exactly inaccurate either right now. So... Well, let's think about the idea of the metaverse, right? So Mark Zuckerberg pitches this idea that we're going to be all immersed in this virtual reality. Well, in a weird sense, we already kind of are immersed in a virtual reality. In other words, people walk around staring at their phones all day. Oh, yeah. No, dude, the around. universal, I, I've been around the world a lot. Right. And the, only, the, the universal, <laughs> like, like I, I think gesture is like this. Yep. <laughs> I was, I remember I was in, I was in the middle of like, um, you know, rural Laos, well, one of the poorest countries in the world. Um you know, communist country too. And everyone's just staring at the phones, no matter where they are, they could be in the middle of a rice field and like, you know, just, you know, that that's, I, I think the universal gesture right now, you know, if you, if you, if you happen to slap that screen on your face, great. Um, it still doesn't remove the fact that you're still immersed in different reality, like you say. And, and, you know, maybe let's talk about that for a sec too, is, is, is the metaverse next after the modern data stack? <laughs> maybe <laughs> web four this we're all web heading into web five or something yeah. yeah exactly yeah it's it's interesting um so but yeah i mean there, there's definitely a lot of uh i would say threads about what's next too but you know yeah. i think this is an ocean you know that again we're kind of we're for better or for worse calling it a you know the, the live data stack and and so that what that means is um just things are happening live things are moving closer to the application layer and so forth uh, and so um so how do we get there? So, so I think one thing that's happened is there have been a lot of very quiet technology changes happening behind the scenes that haven't fully had their impact yet. So what do I mean by this? Um, a few years ago, to stand up Kafka, you were basically going to roll your own, right? It was this huge project, Zookeeper, a bunch of nodes to manage. You had to manage scaling. You had to manage failover, all kinds of crazy stuff. And now there are a bunch of web like cloud services that just do Kafka for you. In fact, there are other services like Kinesis and PubSub that just handle all of those details and you really don't have to think about anything. What is the impact of that? Well, th that layer of messaging is a key component for handling live data. Um, now, just like it took a few years for Redshift, BigQuery, Snowflake to really get traction and start to have a broad impact, I think it's taking some time for these messaging systems to really have their impact and get widely, widely deployed. But I think in practice, we're already heading in that direction and we're going to see, see more and more businesses using data in a more real-time way, yep. um, including small businesses in many cases. You'll have small shops that have like two data people that are able to do something with live data, which a few years ago was completely unthinkable. Well, yeah, that, I think that's the whole point too. Yep. You mentioned small businesses. SMB is where I, I think the, the traction for these um, these new types of data stacks are yeah. going to be. The big companies they can do this stuff if they want right now. You know, they got they got the resources. They probably got the problems to solve. I mean, are there? Do you think there'll be like maybe generic types of problems that um, SMB um, will be uh, trying to solve with these more live data tools? That is a good question. So uh, we've talked also, this is controversial, right? The idea of automated machine learning is still very controversial. You mean like AutoML? AutoML in general, yep. Um, but I think we're seeing more tools where you can basically have like a roll your own, um, or maybe that's not quite, the, more, more like you have a prepackaged recommender. So if you're a small boutique 
online retailer that sells products in a very specialized niche. So say you specialize in selling vinyl, selling LPs, you're the online you know, version of the old record shop. Instead of just having a basic search capability, you can add a recommender to that that potentially can respond in a very dynamic way to user activities. And so again, mm -hmm. if you see a particular record getting a lot of traction, you can start recommending it more often by using off-the-shelf tools. And so you might be a company you know, with employing 25 people and again, unthinkable for you to do something like this 10 years ago, where this becomes accessible for you to use. Yeah, and I, and I think also coupling that with other automated actions behind the scenes. So yeah. automating your supply chain, for example, um, you know, and so forth. So basically just, you know, ultimately bots running your business, right? And then, so I, I think this is inevitably what's going to be happening. Mm -hmm. This is, this is just, mainly because that's a progression of technology itself right a technology like gravity or, or water or it just flows to areas where things can be automated so but right now you know i would say the modern data stack for all of its pluses it's also very friction heavy and and so it just there's still a lot of manual processes involved why you know my, my question too is like for a lot of these things that people write sql for is that even necessary or should that be automated yeah yeah that's a very good question right i mean yeah, what kind of actions? I mean, maybe actions in a warehouse, right? Automated reordering of products and stock, for example. Um, I think a lot of that is still a very, very manual process. But ideally, when you see inventory rapidly declining on an item, you're already planning ahead and saying, hey, we need to get this ordered, especially now with those supply chain issues. Like, we got to get this in the pipeline so that it's going to, in our supply chain, so that we'll have it available in a, mm -hmm. in a week, in a month. Yeah. Dynamic pricing is another really interesting one, right, that we talked about earlier. Um, if there's really, really high demand for a product, can you raise the price fairly quickly and then also have it go back down again when that demand subsides or when you have more inventory in stock mm -hmm. without a lot of human intervention? Yeah, exactly. And then, and so the other thing we, we write about, um, we've, been, we've been writing and thinking about is there, there's sort of this, this other universe that that's parallel to the modern data stack, which the modern data stack has mm -hmm. not been able to, um, you know, disrupt, uh, spreadsheets. Yeah. Yep. Right. So this is this is sort of the I would say the uh, the dark matter of the data world. Um, and we, we've talked about this in other episodes. But I, I, yeah. I think that this is this is a, a, a giant question mark because, you know, so the modern data stack, I think it did a really good job at, um, you know, allowing people to consolidate data if you wanted to do that. Now, of course, we see situations, I would say, not uncommonly where um, companies or, uh, you know, they have data teams, you know, set up the modern data stack. Maybe it's, you know, a cloud data warehouse, you know, all the pipelines and so forth. And the exec team is still making decisions off of, uh, some Excel report they, they had generated sort of, you know, off label, <laughs> i.e. not or even just using their this. gut, right? I've yeah. Seen gut so happens a ton. Times. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's funny. People will combine like gut instinct with like very modern technology like oh yeah we got to increase the bid for this keyword in google ads and they'll go in and like manually tweak things like uh, you, you know you're missing out on a lot of data here and a lot of opportunities yeah. and, and I, I think to be fair gut you know yeah. gut, gut driven decision making definitely has a place uh you know when you're in an air in a as an executive you're, you're sometimes in a um you know making decisions in a low information environment um these happen, I think, more often than you think, uh, because you have a lot of data doesn't mean you have a lot of information, for example, right? Or information that can help you make a good decision. Um, and so this is especially acute when you run into, um, say, recessions or, um, you know, inflection points in your business. Pandemics. Yeah, and so forth, right? And so you just, you, you, there's no playbook and you have to really trust your experience at that point. But yeah, what I find interesting is, you know, we see a lot of companies and how often are spreadsheets used still? all the time, everywhere. Yep. Yep. Everywhere. Even, even you know, I'm not going to name names, but even people we work with at, you know, big tech companies, uh, we'll, we'll often get to get spreadsheets from people, um, for various like to do I, I, you know, lists and, and stuff yeah. like that. And I'm like, Oh man, this is, um, it's, it's, it's funny and ironic and, and everything else in between. So, Salesforce, right? Like we did Salesforce. About oh yeah. We're talking to somebody <laughs> the other day, uh, who um, they made a, a what is a CRM in Excel? They called it Excel's force. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I mean, this also underscores the point that we're talking about what happens after the modern data stack. But but even for many large companies, 
certain silos within those companies aren't even utilizing the modern data stack yet. They're, they're not really even using databases necessarily. Now, this has been like the mid-century modern data stack <laughs> yeah, is Excel. It's, it's very stylish, yeah. I mean, it's just, I, I think, you you know, this, this highlights a pretty uh, big issue that I don't, you know, when we try and bring this up with, uh, you know, other people in the field, our peers, they just sort of turn their nose up at it. Like, oh, that's too hard, right? So we, we bring up right. Excel. So why is it, that despite all the progress we've made as an industry, um, Excel is still the most widely used data platform. And so that, that's sort of the parallel universe, I would say, with what's next after the modern data stack. There's, there's, there's an argument to be made that um, there's not a what's next um, for a lot of the analytics that are being done. It's just, but what I think that the, the, the evolution of maybe the live data stack will do, though, is it will allow analysts, again, to focus on more core questions, like, you know, more decision science type stuff, like why is something happening, not just describing, to, you know, what happened or when did it happen? Those, those are questions I'd say, think about the types of actions you're, you're going to take when you um, look at what or when um, questions, right? You're probably going to do something. Depending on what that something is, can you just automate that? Yeah, and, and you've talked about this notion that um, data engineering is, let, let's not say merge, but let's say somewhat converge with software development. And yeah, it has. Maybe this is the, the future of, of data slash software development is to automate those decisions, right? Set up pipelines and automate certain types of no-brainer decisions where it's like, yeah, every time this happens, we're always going to do X. So why don't we just completely automate that decision? Bingo. Yeah, I mean, I, I learned this when I was at a, you know, a, you know a startup we, we did we had a lot of event data and so forth and people kept asking for real-time dashboards and i'm like it, it, even if i told you to the millisecond like what's going to happen you know what, what has yeah. happened what, what are you going to do about that and so they just told us oh i'm going to do the x y and z and i'm like cool we'll just we'll automate that and we'll just send you a report on what we did so and that, that was back in 2015 i think that's where i you know that was a, the revelation it was like not everything has to be a report um you know so so that, that's, a, I would say, a pretty interesting one. But let's talk about the technologies real quick, right? So like cloud data warehouses, data lakes, or, you know, the, the hotness right now and, and often associated with a modern data stack. What, what comes next? Um, I think what we're already seeing is that these cloud data warehouses are integrating more streaming capabilities. So in other words, you can stream directly to a table and you can query dynamically and your query will return results that are up to date within a couple of seconds. And so you get very, very near real time data. Um, I think we'll see, you know, just broader application of streaming technologies and we'll see things like stream processors become more available, uh, more broadly available. So you already have technologies like KSQL and Kafka, right, where you can just run SQL on a stream. I think at this point it's, it's mostly deployed in more sophisticated companies. I think that kind of technology is going to get much more democratized where it will just become very easy turnkey for anyone to set up. Yeah, and it's becoming like that right now. You know, I mean, it you got is. yeah, yeah. It's um, I mean, it's amazing how many companies I'm seeing that are definitely pushing the you know low latency ingest, low latency query um, databases and technology. Um, you know, so if we talk about databases, some, some contemporaries right now. You got Imply, which is managed Druid. You have ClickHouse. You got Rockset. Um, you know, many, many more. We're even starting yeah. to see people using more um, like time series specific databases, like time scale, um, you know, for certain types of use cases. I think that's wonderful for an IoT type application, for example. And, and, and on the flip side, you're starting to see hybrid databases, you know, single store being, I would say, the predominant one. Um, they, you know, mix OLTP with OLAP, you know, all in one um, database. I, I think so, you know, and, and even the, you know, the big companies, you know, the, the big uh, data warehouses are, are, they're not blind to this. I mean, BigQuery has offered streaming in Jest for a while. It's, yeah. you know, and, um, you know, you, I would say if you look at the recent hires at some of the other uh, cloud data warehouses or lake companies, it's pretty obvious where things are going to be going. They're moving, they, they see the direction. It's all on, you know, fast, fast ingest, fast read. So. Yeah, and uh, and part of what we've been arguing for a while as well is that we're going to see more high da database hybridization beyond just single store. And what that means in practice is that we're going to build on these uh, automated managed deployments of transactional databases in cloud environments where you could just deploy Postgres automatically. 
And you'll also get like a batch query layer that runs on top of that. Now, people argue correctly that you, the cap theorem doesn't really let you have one database to do everything. But what's really happening behind the scenes is that you have a streaming layer, the data gets dumped into another database, and you can query that for doing analytics queries directly, very close to real time on top of the transactional data. The difference is that this, you won't really see those layers anymore. They're gonna be increasingly hidden from people, and they'll just kind of run automatically behind the scenes, which will really democratize this technology. Mm -hmm. Actually, Mark has a good question here. Yeah. It, it seems that open source projects are creating um, some great stuff with the intent of having a paid cloud version, but as you get, as it gets better, um, you can just use it in house without having to go to the cloud. Uh, could this lead to a decreased investment in this business model? That's an interesting question. And Mark asked in an earlier question if we're going to be, see people circling back on prem. Um, <laughs> let's be frank that the Okta hack certainly makes that a little more likely than it was, say, three weeks ago before people knew about it, right? Mm -hmm. I think people are going to be very nervous after that. It's possible. I mean, I don't know. What do you think, Joe? Because in principle, there, there's always there's already this notion of like on-prem cloud where you basically have more fully managed infrastructure that runs on-prem where you get some of the advantages of the cloud, but you still get to keep things under your own roof. So maybe we'll see more of that. I agree. I mean, there's a lot of things I think that um, uh, are going to be changing investments in business models. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting question. The, the um, reversion, um, I wouldn't say reversion, but maybe the... Uh, not going to the cloud at all. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, a lot of things can drive this, right? So, uh, Mark asked what happened three weeks ago, by the way. Oh, oh, just more that the this Okta, the Okta hack actually happened back in January, but it just became public, like actually, what was it, last week? So, three weeks ago, meaning, you know, pre Okta hack versus now post Okta hack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it... Yeah, I, yeah, I'm, 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 I mean, it just seems to be the general model, though, right? Yeah. Where you have an open source project, you create, a, you know, a paid managed service, commercial open source around it, and then, um, you know, get funding and, um, and all sorts of things. I think. So, it, it, to me, it's a question of investment in a in a business model versus investment in a product. I think mm -hmm. the investment in a business model that's undergoing a sea change right now with rising rates, uh, multiple yeah. valuation, you know, or compressing like crazy right now. Um, I mean, everyone should listen to the All In podcast that just came out uh, over the weekend. Uh, Shamath and, and crew go through a, a very good analysis of what happens when rates rise. Uh, I mean, Shamath brought up a pretty interesting stat where it's like it, for each 100 basis point increase of interest rates, you see a 15 to 20 percent um, decrease in the valuation of a company. You can just wipe off and mark down. And yeah. um and so what, what's, you know, they go into the dynamics too of what happens uh, in general as rates go up, as um, companies now have to start uh, doing strange things like, uh, let me see, making money and maybe a profit, um, things that, raise. Yeah. no, it's, it's, yeah. it, I think you're going to see a lot of, uh, you know, cause what, cause a lot of these companies raise evaluations that are going to be, um, you know, pretty crazy to justify unless they, the business model supports it. And so, uh, you know, I think their hypothesis, and I do agree, is down rounds galore coming up. So, yeah, and we could see a bloodbath of, of some startups just not getting funding and going bankrupt. I, I think we're probably going to see a lot of acquisitions in practice because the reality is that your big tech players are really flush with cash right now, right? Mm -hmm. They've done very well in the last two years, all of your cloud platforms. And so when valuations, some of the companies drop, they're, they're going to come in and make offers that the founders can't refuse, right? Like, uh, we're going to oh, acquire... Well, they can't refuse it for a lot of reasons, yeah, yeah. so... <laughs> <Yeah. It's> like... <laughs> now, the problem is that acquisitions do not have a great track record in general, right? We've seen this again and again where these companies get acquired and they just never quite get integrated. The employees, you know, contribute to the new tech company that acquires them, but the technology itself may just languish and maybe completely disappear. Yeah, and so I'm curious to see what this does yeah. to the modern data stack ecosystem, exactly. for example, because... Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's no secret. There's been a lot of money thrown in. I think I can't, don't quote me on this. I think it was like maybe $14 billion in funding based on the A16, uh, slide that came out or they had a report that came out last week. I need plenty to dig it up and just look. Um, yeah. but anyway, so there's, there's a lot of money invested, um, you know, and, um, a lot of, you know, quote paper value generated, but we'll see. But what this means too, is there's, there's a next generation of, of ideas and products that are going to come up. I mean, you know, it's, the interview I did with Matt Turka, you know, on the uh, Data Nerd Herd, um, that was posted a few weeks ago. I mean, he said too, he feels like 
we're definitely in the late stage of this investment cycle in, in this particular yeah. um, epoch of uh, of data tools. But this doesn't mean that it's by any means over. In a lot of ways, I think we're just getting started. But you know, um, you know, exuberance and sometimes irrational exuberance means that you know there's a lot of money sloshing around and they go to deals and sometimes things don't work out, but that doesn't mean that the industry is bad or that there won't be progressions. Like, I think there's some awesome things happening. Le you know, last week we um, talked with our, our friend Devaris um, Brown over at Maroxa and he showed us, you know, the demo of, um, you know, his SDK. We, you know, I, I had that on the show uh, last month of the uh, Conduit project they're working on. When, when he, he texted me that video back, I think like early February, um, just basically the ability to write, you know, a streaming pipeline using a, a an SDK, I think it was in JavaScript or something like that. And I immediately I was like, okay, this reminds me a lot of what like kind of the um the Rails demo that uh David Hanemeyer Hansen did back in the day. Where he's like, here's Rails, here's how quickly you can spin up a a website. I was like, this is this is cool. It's um really and I felt cool. the same way with yeah. with yeah what they're doing. And, you know, and so and I think they're they're aligned with our, our ideas on um you know sort of the next generation of uh, data stacks, which is, I think everything's moving to the application layer. I can make a very strong argument that um, the mo well, the modern data stack will still have a place. It's It could, and actually I think does present uh, several bottlenecks in workflows right now. Yeah, yeah. I think increasingly what we're gonna see is more integration between the live part of data and application developers, just like you're saying, that as you're designing the application, the real-time analytics will basically be built in. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to be seeing more move toward event-driven architectures yep. where instead of making an API call and saying, hey, do this thing and then waiting for that to finish, you just send a message on the bus. You send it on Kafka or PubSub or whatever. And downstream, something processes that, but there's another piece of that pipeline that also analyzes that message that you just sent. Um, so I think it's going to be a rethink of how we develop applications and how we do data. The modern data stack will still exist in the sense that you're going to want to do look back analytics. You're going to want to do monthly reporting and such. That's what the modern data stack is. Going are you? To gonna, are we going to call it the modern data stack? I, I mean, yeah, it's not. Thing. It's right. not even that modern. It's been. Right, right. I mean, like I said, it, I, I can. You know, if you define it as uh, when Redshift um, came on the scene, it's ten years old now. There's not much modern about it. And so I would just maybe call it the, maybe the cloud data warehouse lakes lake house stack or something i don't know um but it doesn't necessarily fit into the um i think the progression of where things are going right so right, exactly. and as we argue things like metrics layers for example it, mm -hmm. it, it burns my brain i think it's in exactly the wrong spot uh it's in a spot that's convenient for analysts but it's not in a spot where it makes a lot of sense from a uh quality control perspective it needs to be at the source right Right. And, and we've been talking to there, there's kind of this debate about data modeling and there's a whole school of thought that says don't model the data. And I, I think what we're increasingly leaning toward is that you model the data, but the mo data model for the application is also the same data model that's used yeah. for analytics. Exactly. Which, which means yeah. that ETL is actually going to become sexy again. So, cause as you're dealing with streams, as actually yeah. talking with, um, you know, not to name drop, but you know, uh, the Godfather of Data Warehouse over the weekend about this, Bill Inman. You totally um, name dropped. You totally name so, dropped. but we, you know, because he's he sent he sent an article which we'll be posting on our um our uh, uh, newsletter this week actually about um, data transformations and whatnot. And but I, you know, during our conversation, I was like, this is interesting because uh, I really feel like ETL has been um, sort of shoveled off to the wayside right now. But with right. streaming, you, you, ELT is actually an anti pattern. I mean, how how does that work? Yeah, I, I kind of feel like maybe we even need a new term. Like maybe we just STL streaming. Well, yeah, it's not, yeah, you're it's not something. extracting anything, right? You're, you're not extracting yeah. anything, right? Like uh, the reality is that there's that the, there's now less clean centralization and organization of data than there used to be, and so it's not like like the whole notion of ETL and ELT is based around the notion that you're you've got some centralized you know every all your data is going into one central place which i, I think with streaming it, does it become a bit more decentralized in general i well, kind of feel like it does okay so let's let's walk through that real quick yeah. so you have an e and a t and an l so tell me what you're extracting <laughs> exactly it's just so tell me what generated. and why are you loading yeah. it yeah that's right yeah right and so there's implicit loading in the sense where, you know, if you're using Kafka, like it stores data somewhere, but that's not right. really a storage layer that you care about, right? You just care about the stream. And so maybe it's just T. 
Yeah, especially where Kafka is part of the application itself and also part of your analytics, right? The lines really become blurred and it's less of this discrete ETL, ELT, basically. Yeah, Igor says, uh, Igor says, I'm team data modeling, which I tend to agree with. Where that modeling happens is another concept, but I, I don't think, I think the idea of just discarding data modeling is slightly problematic. But we've seen this too, yeah. right? I mean, that, that's, um, there, there are definitely certain religions. Right. Um, some say data modeling shouldn't happen. Um, the question I posed, uh, you know, a couple of months ago on LinkedIn was with, with stream data modeling, like, What's the equivalent? So we've, you know, if you look back at the, the history of data modeling, um, yeah. you know, Inman, you know, uh, he came up with his his version of it, um, you know, ETL, uh, third normal form um, yeah. to data marts, right? And the data marts would basically be modeled according to whatever business concept you're uh, supplying downstream. Uh, Ralph Kimball, you know, he had the star schema and yeah. uh, very denormalized. Um, yeah. You know, data vault to some extent, I think it, it's more of a, a to me, it's more of a storage and ingestion pattern upon which you can build star schemas. Um, but that's still a data model. But then it is. tell me, you know, what, what are the mainstream uh, stream data models that are uh, widely applauded and used right now? There aren't any. And even for batch processing, we've been arguing for a while that um, while Kimball star schema is great, it, we really kind of need to re relax some of the strictures of star schema to make it work in modern data systems. Like it does not allow for things like arrays and nested data. It's just not part of the concept because it goes back quite a ways. Well, it's from the 90s. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and so there are a lot of, and, and the problem is that no one has really, as far as I know, sat down to say, hey, here's the next generation of data modeling. I think it's very ad hoc right now. I think people are doing the best they can to kind of take these old paradigms and do new things with them. But I think there does need to be an effort to say, okay, this is a new vision of what data modeling should be and it actually integrates the application more directly with the well and for there. the live data sector to work it, yeah, it has exactly. to be i mean what we yeah. have in mind is basically a um you know successive um either semantic or, or modeling definitions all across right. from, from application all the way through uh, where data is used because igor correctly points out um concepts shift yeah right and so there's, there's there's drift and what makes sense for an engineer may not um you know make any sense for you know, when I, when I have to compute a, uh, you know, a 36 month roll up, uh, revenue as a metric like that's, um, you know, not the same thing per se. Sorry. My son's yeah. rude and just slams the door on me. Um, <laughs> so, um, he disagrees with your thoughts on data modeling. Like, that's what that was about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's a great kid. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, so, so, I mean, the notion that we have is, you know, maybe there's, I mean, there has to be some sort of, uh, of a layer um, and some sort of observability that, that I think yeah. doesn't just apply to, uh, you know, say Snowflake and, and the associated technologies in that periphery, but end to end, um, you know, semantic metrics. I think we just call it the definitions layer in our book where it's just because uh, that definitions can take on a, a bunch of things, quantitative, qualitative, yeah. and so forth. Um, descriptions is another one. That's that's but those are all part of just the metadata that describes the data. But you have to describe it as it flows through the entire system, not just when it hits a data warehouse and you're using it for reporting. I think it's an extremely myopic way of looking at the world. So, yeah, and another, I, I think a question I have about the future, which I don't have a good answer to yet. Maybe you. Why not, Matt? Answer. Why it's not? One vision you have, <laughs> um, is that uh, if we okay, so. Like I said, I don't think I don't personally don't think batch is going away. I think streaming becomes more central. In other words, streaming now becomes the foundation, and the batch happens afterward, rather than processing everything in batch, which is very common right now. Um, my question is: Do we have separate data models for real time and for batch? So, in other words, do we have kind of an application data model that goes straight into the stream that gets analyzed? Do we then, you know, normalize more when we go into batch? And that's less clear to me. But I think your vision is that. They should all really be the same, and there might be some awkwardness to that where you don't have any normalization. But the advantage is that you are not changing data models partway through, and so you have this consistency when you look at live versus historic data. Yeah, I think it's yeah. very situation dependent. Yeah, and so I mean, the answer to the to your question is yes. Uh, so you know, if you if you like your star schema, you can keep your star schema. So <laughs> we've heard those promises before. <laughs> But in all seriousness, you know, I mean, yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 what streaming is going to do is it's going, you know, in the, in the live data stack, what I think it's going to do is it's going to, um, I think, get rid of a lot of these kind of um, 
you know, dogmatic approaches, hopefully, yeah. right? I, I think that there's, it, it really depends on the types of system you're using and the type of output you're expecting and the use case, yeah. right? Um, but it, it's, you know, and again, I, th I think there's been a lot of great things that have come out of the modern data stack or whatever yeah. it's called in the future. But um, I guess I feel like we're just getting started with this, you know, to kind of bring it back. So Yeah, and I, this is what I'll say as well. I think in the tech industry, particularly in Silicon Valley, there's this tendency to be extremely dismissive toward whatever came before. Like, oh, we have Hadoop now. We're reinventing everything. We don't need you people anymore. We don't need your data warehouses. We don't need your data models. And then eventually they circle back and say, actually, now we're using Hive and we care about normalization. So I, I think in general, we want to get out of the habit of just dismissing what's old because what's old is actually stuff that makes money and was very good at the time and is still very good now. It's just let's think in terms of enhancements to previous contributions. I mean, ideally, that's what we do in science, right? Like Einstein wasn't really saying that general relativity wipes out the theory of gravitation. He was saying that it was an enhancement. Like, actually, it's not quite what Newton said, but we're enhancing it and we have a clearer idea of how it works now. And that's that's what we're doing here now, too, right? It's like we're building on all these past contributions and hopefully building towards something better. Yeah. Or something worse. I don't or know. something worse. I mean, we can always make it worse and we'll all be in the metasphere and uh, we will not interact with the real world anymore and people won't go outside and they'll just live in their little bubbles. And... Uh, I mean, how is that any different than what we do now? <laughs> so, <laughs> like, We're going to connect ourselves to the Matrix. I saw that movie. I haven't seen this, all the sequels yet, but... <laughs> I rewatched it a few weeks ago. It's It's... It's it's okay. I don't know. I the original, was, the yeah, original like, yeah. It's it's okay. Did you ever? I want my kids. I want my kids to watch it, and they're kind of like, I don't understand why this is so fascinating. To yeah, me. yeah, yeah. Because at the time, it was like it was like video games, but enhanced. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you ever watch Dark City though? That the movie that was shot on the same set. That's super mm -mm. super weird. I'll have to send you the link if anyone's. It's it's also a very strange movie about like immersion into an alternate reality. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, <laughs> that's up. Centon is. Uh, she's got. She just had some awesome points this whole time. Uh, can have both quasi real time pipelines that actively learn from and react to application data as well as batch pipelines. Yeah, agreed. And I think you have so, to, right? I, I think mm -hmm. there are just a lot of things that we don't yet know how to do in real time, including a lot of uh, machine learning. Even though there are various developments happening, they we they haven't replaced batch yet with real time. So you, you're going to need both in the future. Yeah, micro batch. Micro batch, yes. That's how you go. Cool. Got one more question here. This will take about a couple seconds. Um, from Vicky on from YouTube. Uh, is data vault does data vault come under one of the future um, those future data modeling? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, I think you've thought a lot about this. Actually, I think you've studied this a bit. Well, I read the whole book. Um, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> we had to for. <laughs> I I feel like you know data vault is. I, I think it's got a lot of good intentions. Um. There seems to be, I would say, a lot of orthodoxy around the implementation of it that I find maybe a bit um, unwieldy for certain types of companies. I mean, certainly companies are doing it, um, and I would love to see it adopted more. I think, like I said, it's got a lot of good intentions, but it seems to come with quite a bit of, um, how would I say, overhead. So, mm -hmm. but we'll see. I mean, I, I, I think it is a part of future data modeling for sure, as, as well as other techniques are. So. And it's the same thing we, you know, I think um, what we need to figure out is how we integrate these techniques and enhance them, not discard them. You know, same thing with Kimball. I think there's a lot to be said for at least partial normalization, but how do you determine where the boundary is between normalization and denormalization? I don't think anyone's answered that question. Well, yet. and Inman too. I mean, if you, if you actually yeah. look at what he wrote back in the yeah. 90s, um, it, it basically, he described, um, ELT to some extent, right? Mm -hmm. It was, he, you load data into an operational data store. Yep. Um, but if you actually look at the original diagrams, I was like, that is pretty much the same thing as like what you're doing right now, um, yeah. to a large extent, just um, extracting and loading data. And so the you know, what's old is new again, right? And I would say, yeah. if anyone wants a, a, a you know a look at where things are going, I would say just look at where software engineering has been for the last twenty years. That provides your template. All all, all that's happening in the data world typically is that we're taking practices uh, that have been, you know adopted and, and widely refined in software engineering and applying them to data and machine learning, you know? Yeah. So, um, so, you know, the, in a lot of ways you don't have to reinvent the wheel, just go to a different tire store and look at what they have. So, yeah. And you have to figure out how to adapt those practices to data. That's yep. the very tricky part. Um, so one thing we talked a lot about again is, uh, 
observability, why do you need observability for data? Well, because so much of it comes from outside your own walls. And so unlike, you know, code deployments, you actually don't have full control of how the world is changing. So if people decide to attack your site with more bots, it's going to affect your data. You have to dynamically respond to that. And so we have to take those software development practices and enhance them in data specific ways. Yeah. Cool. Thanks to the audience. Uh, great questions. Yeah. Great comments. Um, we'll be talking probably you know more on this topic. It's something that Matt and I nerd out a lot about. Um, I guess we'll be doing a, a show next Monday. I guess we we are. Um, I think we'll be back from that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's yeah. Plan on we'll next be back. Monday. Yeah. Awesome. Um, then we, on Friday we got a, a live show uh, with Starburst, um, and so check that out. Uh, we're going to be talking all about. Um, Starburst data mesh, all that stuff. Matt's going to be running that discussion because I'm actually going to be in the middle of the desert. Um, so taking a well-deserved and badly needed vacation. <laughs> yeah, this is the look of uh, this is the look of um, <laughs> a lot of uh, this is what happens when you work a lot. So, um, but yeah, we're uh, ternary data. So we offer data architecture, data engineering, consulting. Um, contact us at our site ternarydata.com. So. Um, we also offer a uh, data engineering team as a service if you're interested in that. So feel free to hit us up. I'm happy to chat. So, and subscribe to our newsletter at ternarydata.com. Like I said, we're going to be uh, publishing a, um, an article from Bill Inman. So um, hopefully you'll dig that. So Yeah, and, and frankly, maybe we should do guest posts or guest Yeah, if you're interested in doing a guest post weeks, for us. Because yeah. we, we got to finish the book, right? Yeah, like, we have yeah, both deadlines. So if anyone, <laughs> honestly, if anyone yeah. wants to write a, an article, yeah. we're happy to anonymize it as well. Uh, feel free to... Um, you know, message me yeah. on LinkedIn or uh, email us at ternarydata.com. And uh, we'll see you very soon. So take care. Thanks again.